name Tecumseh translates as shooting star, a fitting name for the Shawnee chief who reached meteoric heights of fame across Indian country. He was, by all accounts, a charismatic leader. Graceful, eloquent, brilliant, Tecumseh was all these and more, a gifted natural commander, equal parts politician and warrior. The Ohio country, where Tecumseh was born in 1768, was home to some dozen Indian nations. During the Revolutionary War, the region became a battleground. Tecumseh lost his father and two brothers to the violence. The revolution's end in 1783 brought no peace to Indian country, however. The youthful Tecumseh fought at the devastating defeat of fallen timbers and watched as eight treaties ceded much of Ohio to the Americans between 1795 and 1805. Some Native Americans resigned themselves to accommodation, taking up farming, trade, and intermarriage with white settlers. Others found refuge in alcohol. Tecumseh's younger brother, Lalawetheka, led an embittered life of idleness and drink, but Tecumseh rejected accommodation and instead campaigned for a return to ancient ways. Donning traditional animal skin clothing, he traveled around the Great Lakes region persuading tribes to join his pan-Indian confederacy. The territorial governor of Indiana, William Henry Harrison, admired and feared Tecumseh, calling him one of those uncommon geniuses which spring up occasionally to produce revolutions. Even Tecumseh's dissolute brother was born anew. After a near-death experience in 1805, Lalawetheka recounted a startling vision of meeting the Master of Life. Renaming himself Tenskwataway, or the Open Door, he urged his many Indian followers to regard whites as children of the evil spirit, destined for destruction. President Thomas Jefferson worried about the Indian Confederacy and its potential for a renewed alliance with the British in Canada. His worries became a reality as the threat of war with Britain reemerged and the Indian-British alliance rematerialized along the Canadian-U.S. border. In the end, the War of 1812 settled little between the United States and Britain. Its effect on Indian country, by contrast, was transformative. 800 warriors led by Tecumseh helped defend Canada against U.S. attacks, but the British did not reciprocate when the Indians came under threat. Tecumseh died on a Canadian battlefield in the fall of 1813. No Indian leader with his star power would emerge again east of the Mississippi. When the war between Britain and the United States ended, so did the dream of any substantial territory controlled by native peoples in between the two countries. Tecumseh's ability to unite disparate Native American peoples had no counterpart in the Young Republic's Confederation of States. Widespread unity behind a single leader proved impossible. Bitter partisan conflict continued during the Jefferson and Madison administrations, but Federalists doomed their party by opposing the War of 1812. The next two presidents, James Monroe and John Quincy Adams, congratulated themselves on the Federalist Party's demise, but divisions within their own party persisted. Wives of politicians increasingly inserted themselves into this dissonant mix, managing their husbands' politicking and enabling them to maintain the fiction of nonpartisanship. That it was a fiction had become sharply apparent by the time John Quincy Adams ascended the presidency in 1825. The first presidential election of the new century provoked an all-out partisan war. A panicky Federalist newspaper in Connecticut predicted that a victory by Thomas Jefferson would lead to civil war and murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest. Apocalyptic fears gripped parts of the South, where some whites predicted a slave uprising if Jefferson won. Nothing nearly so dramatic occurred. True, Jefferson later called his election the Revolution of 1800, but the reality of Jeffersonian government was more complicated. While Jefferson cherished Republican simplicity in principle, events required decisive and sometimes expensive government action, including war overseas to protect American shipping. The election of 1800 was historic for many reasons. One is that it was the first to be decided by the House of Representatives. Probably by mistake, voters in the Electoral College gave Jefferson and his running mate, Senator Aaron Burr of New York, an equal number of votes. To fix this problem, the Twelfth Amendment to the Constitution, adopted in 1804, separated the votes for president and vice president. Since the vote resulted in a tie, 
the House had to choose between these two men. The Federalist candidate, John Adams, was eliminated. Although he was the Democratic-Republican candidate for vice president, Burr declined to concede. It thus fell to the Federalist-dominated House of Representatives in its waning days in early 1801 to choose the next president. Some Federalists preferred Burr, believing that his character flaws made him susceptible to Federalist pressure. But the influential Alexander Hamilton, though no friend of Jefferson's, believed that the vain and ambitious Burr would be more dangerous in the presidency. Jefferson might be a contemptible hypocrite in Hamilton's opinion, but at least he could be counted on to put the nation's interests ahead of his own. In 1804, Burr would shoot and kill Hamilton in a duel. Thirty-six ballots and six days later, Jefferson won the presidency. Jefferson's victory marked a second historic feature of the election of 1800. For the first time, a sitting president was defeated and governmental control passed from one party to its opposition. This peaceful transfer of power was extraordinary for the time. It had few precedents in history. The Federalists were divided between a Hamilton-influenced faction that grumpily resolved itself to the fact of Jefferson's presidency, while a more dogmatic faction refused to accept it. John Adams, once one of Jefferson's best friends in a series of so-called midnight appointments, installed a slew of judges to federal benches that he knew would oppose anything the new president would want to do, then left Washington, D.C. in the wee hours of the day Jefferson was to be inaugurated so as not to participate in the event. Jefferson lodged in a boarding house rather than stay in more lavish accommodations thought to befit a new head of state, dressed for his inauguration in the same simple brown suit he wore to Washington's inaugural ball, and put on shoes with laces because he thought silver buckles to be too aristocratic and not sufficiently democratic or republican. Scorning transport to the Capitol building in a coach and six, as his predecessor had done, he walked to his inauguration. His acceptance speech was brief, but full of conciliation designed to heal the political divisions engendered in the last decade. Every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have called by different names brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. If there be any among us who would wish to dissolve this union or to change its Republican form, let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated, where reason is left free to combat it. When he arrived at the executive mansion, as the president's residence was then called, he declared it too grandiose, big enough to house two emperors, one pope, and the Grand Lama of Tibet in addition to himself. He opted to live in a small portion of the second-floor residence and declared that since this was a house built and maintained with taxpayer dollars, that it was properly theirs, inviting any citizen to stop by to see him whenever he was there. Bear in mind, though, that very few people could make the trip to the capital city, and fewer still would have dared to presume to just walk into the executive mansion and demand to see the president. As the country struggled over this crisis in political leadership, a 24-year-old blacksmith named Gabriel plotted rebellion in Virginia. Inspired by the Haitian Revolution, Gabriel was said to be organizing a thousand slaves to march on the state capitol and take the governor, James Monroe, hostage. On the appointed day, however, a few nervous slaves confessed the news of Gabriel's rebellion to authorities. Within days, scores of implicated conspirators were jailed and put on trial. One of the rebels compared himself to the most venerated icon of the early republic. I have nothing more to offer than what General Washington would have had to offer had he been taken by the British and put to trial by them. The specter of a black George Washington terrified white Virginians. That example could only go so far. In the fall of 1800, 26 men, including Gabriel, were hanged for allegedly taking part in the rebellion. Once elected, Thomas Jefferson set out to roll back Federalist government. As president, he dramatically reduced the size of the federal government and slashed the budget. Jefferson was no anti-Federalist. He had supported the Constitution in 1788, though a diplomat in France at the time. But he worried that the executive branch had grown too powerful, jeopardizing the Constitution's careful balance and threatening the nation's Republican character. He had opposed Hamiltonian policies to refinance the public debt, 
establish a national bank, and foster commercial ties with Britain. In Jefferson's eyes, these policies favored the interests of greedy speculators and merchants over honest citizens and would inevitably lead to the government's corruption. He believed that Republican liberty could flourish only in a nation of virtuous, independent farmers who owned and worked their land. Although his own economic situation hardly conformed to his political vision, Jefferson owned hundreds of slaves and lived from the profits of their exploited labor. Many Americans shared his views. As president, Jefferson set about systematically dismantling Federalist innovations. He cut the military budget in half. Favoring militias over standing armies, he reduced the size of the army by a third and cut the navy back to six ships from 30. With Congress's consent, he abolished internal federal taxes, dramatically shrinking government revenue, which would now be derived solely from customs duties and the sale of Western land. Jefferson similarly rolled back Federalist attempts to create a national elite and endow the federal government with symbols of authority. Martha Washington and Abigail Adams had received the wives of government officials at weekly teas, cementing social relations among the governing class. But Jefferson, a longtime widower, disdained such gatherings and abandoned George Washington's formal receptions. Instead, he hosted small dinner parties with carefully chosen guests. He sold the coaches and horses and silver harnesses that President Adams had used, keeping only a one-horse market cart. Jefferson would often surprise visitors to the executive mansion with his refusal to put on aristocratic airs. Senator William Plummer of New Hampshire, who had never met Jefferson before, came to call one day and, a few moments after our arrival, a tall, high-boned man came into the room. He was dressed, or rather undressed, in an old brown coat, red waistcoat, old corduroy small clothes, much soiled, woolen hose, and slippers without heels. I thought him a servant, when General Varnum surprised me by announcing that it was the president. In keeping with a diminished presence, Jefferson likewise set about diminishing the federal government. A federal government limited to its proper size, according to Jefferson, maintained a postal system, federal courts, and coastal lighthouses. It collected customs duties and conducted the census. He believed it should do little else. The president had one private secretary, a young man named Meriwether Lewis, whom he paid out of his own pocket. The Department of State employed eight people, Secretary James Madison, six clerks, and a messenger. The Treasury Department was by far the largest, with 73 revenue commissioners, auditors, and clerks, plus two watchmen. The payroll of the entire executive branch amounted to just 130 people in 1801. By the end of his first term, Jefferson had dramatically reduced the national debt. However, 217 government workers lay beyond Jefferson's command. Judicial and military appointments made just days before Jefferson took office. Jefferson repudiated the appointment of these midnight judges. One disappointed job seeker, William Marbury, sued the new Secretary of State, James Madison, for refusing to deliver his commission. This suit gave rise to the 1803 Supreme Court decision, Marbury v. Madison. The court found that the grounds of Marbury's suit, resting in the Judiciary Act of 1789, conflicted with the Constitution. For the first time, the court invalidated a federal law on the grounds that it was unconstitutional. Interestingly, the Supreme Court's authority to overturn laws of Congress, the principle known as judicial review, is nowhere mentioned in the text of the Constitution. Jefferson's ambition to reduce the size of the federal government and the military met a severe test in the western Mediterranean Sea. For more than a century, the states of Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli, situated along the Mediterranean coast of Africa and called the Barbary States by Americans, demanded large annual payments, called tribute, for safe passage of ship traffic along their coastlines. Countries refusing to pay risked the seizure of their ships and crews. With its independence, the United States lost the protection of the British Empire, and during the 1790s, several hundred American crew members were taken captive and held in slavery. Eventually, the United States agreed to pay $50,000 a year in tribute to secure safe passage for its ships. In May 1801, 
when the monarch of Tripoli failed to secure a large increase in his tribute, he declared war on the United States. Jefferson considered such payments extortion and sent four warships to the Mediterranean to protect U.S. shipping. From 1801 to 1803, U.S. frigates engaged in skirmishes with North African privateers. Then, in late 1803, the USS Philadelphia ran aground near Tripoli's harbor and was captured along with its 300-man crew. Early the next year, a U.S. naval ship commanded by Lieutenant Stephen Decatur sailed into the harbor after dark, guided by an Arabic-speaking pilot to fool harbor sentries. Decatur's crew set the Philadelphia on fire, rendering it useless to the Tripoli monarch. Later, in 1804, a small force of U.S. ships attacked the harbor and damaged or destroyed 19 Tripolitan ships and bombarded the city. Yet the sailors from the Philadelphia remained in captivity. In 1805, William Eaton, an American officer stationed in Tunis, requested a thousand Marines to invade Tripoli. Secretary of State James Madison rejected the plan. On his own, Eaton assembled a force of 400 men, mostly Greek and Egyptian mercenaries plus eight American Marines, and marched them over 500 miles of desert for a surprise attack on Tripoli's second largest city. Amazingly, he succeeded. The monarch of Tripoli yielded, released the prisoners taken from the Philadelphia, and negotiated a treaty with the United States. Periodic attacks by Algiers and Tunis continued to plague American ships during Jefferson's second term of office and into his successors. The Second Barbary War ended in 1815 when the hero of 1804, Stephen Decatur, sailed to the northern coast of Africa with a fleet of 27 ships. By show of force, he engineered three treaties that put an end to the tribute system and provided reparations for damages to U.S. ships. In 1803, an unanticipated opportunity presented itself when France offered to sell its territory west of the Mississippi River to the United States. President Jefferson set aside his usually cautious exercise of federal power and quickly accepted. He soon launched four expeditions into the prairie and mountains to explore this huge acquisition. The powerful Osage of the Arkansas River Valley responded to overtures for an alliance were soon lavishly welcomed by Jefferson in Washington, but the even more powerful Comanche of the southern Great Plains stood their ground against all invaders. Meanwhile, the expedition by Lewis and Clark, the longest and northernmost trek of the four launched by Jefferson, mapped U.S. terrain all the way to the Pacific Ocean, boosting expansionist aspirations. In 1763, at the end of the Seven Years' War, France had transferred its imperial claims on the vast territory between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains to Spain. Whatever the lines drawn on maps in European capitals might have indicated, however, the territory was never very Spanish. Centered on the Great Plains, it was home to numerous Indian nations, most notably the powerful and expansionist Comanche nation. New Orleans was Spain's principal stronghold, a city of French origins and populations situated on the Mississippi River near its outlet at the Gulf of Mexico. An essential geographic fact made it the single most strategic city in North America. All the major rivers between the Appalachian and Rocky Mountains, including the Ohio River Basin, which the United States had fought a series of wars to control, drained down the Mississippi past New Orleans. Whatever power controlled New Orleans thus exercised an outsized influence on the commerce of the Northwest Territories along with Kentucky, Tennessee, and Western Pennsylvania. Since the 1780s, Spain had earned modest revenues from taxes it imposed on the agricultural products shipped downriver from American farms. Spanish officials recognized that their sparse population could not withstand the westward movement of Americans and that their best hope lay in maintaining an expansive network of Indian alliances. Under pressure from the French Emperor Napoleon, whose armies had conquered much of Europe, Spain ceded the Louisiana Territory to France. Spanish officials hoped that a French Louisiana would provide a buffer zone between Spain's valuable holdings in northern Mexico and the land-hungry Americans. The French Emperor Napoleon agreed to Spain's condition that France could not sell Louisiana to anyone without Spanish permission. From the U.S. perspective, Spain had proved a weak neighbor, one it could confidently expect to displace one day. But France was another story.
As one of Europe's greatest powers, its armies had just conquered most of Europe while its navy controlled large parts of the Caribbean. The rumored transfer alarmed Jefferson. Whatever his sympathies for France, Jefferson recognized the danger a French Louisiana posed to the United States. He instructed Robert R. Livingston, America's minister in France, to try to purchase New Orleans. In the negotiations, Livingston hinted that the United States might seize New Orleans if buying was not an option. The prospect of war in North America did not appeal to Napoleon. On the verge of war with Britain, France needed both money and neutrality from the United States. In addition, the recent devastating loss of Haiti, its most valuable Caribbean possession, made a French presence in New Orleans far less desirable. The French offered to sell the entire Louisiana Territory to the United States. To his astonishment, Livingston secured the vast territory for the bargain basement price of $15 million. With such an extraordinary prize dangling before him, Jefferson set aside his scruples about the scope of federal power. Although he had no constitutional authority to make such a purchase, the prospect was too good to pass up. Jefferson gained congressional approval for the Louisiana Purchase, but without the votes of Federalist New England, which feared that a vast national expansion would weaken the Federalist Party. In late 1803, the American Army took formal control of the Louisiana Territory, and the United States nearly doubled in size, at least on paper. Jefferson quickly launched four government-funded expeditions up the river valleys of the new territory to establish relationships with Indian peoples and determine the extent of European influence. The first, in 1804, set out toward the upper reaches of the Missouri River. Jefferson appointed his 28-year-old secretary, Meriwether Lewis, as its head. He instructed Lewis to investigate Indian cultures, collect plant and animal specimens, and chart the geography of the West. Congress asked the expedition to scout locations for military posts, negotiate fur trade agreements, and identify river routes to the West. For his co-leader, Lewis chose Kentuckian William Clark, a veteran of the 1790s Indian Wars. They recruited a crew of 45, including expert rivermen, gunsmiths, hunters, interpreters, a cook, and Clark's personal slave, York. Things did not get off to an auspicious start, however. Leaving St. Louis in June 1804, the explorers headed up the Missouri River in half a dozen canoes and two pirogues. They tested their skills at Indian diplomacy among the Otos, Omahas, and Missouris, once powerful tribes already badly reduced by the ravages of disease outbreaks. Then, in September, they encountered a band of Brule or Sikanju Sioux, a stout, bold-looking people, said Clark. The Sioux were accustomed to levying tribute from St. Louis traders and were not about to allow the American strangers to pass upriver to other tribes without exacting some share of their cargo. Clark called them the Pirates of the Missouri. Eager to demonstrate that the United States would not be bullied, the Americans were equally determined not to concede. There was a tense scene in which each side stood to arms. I felt myself warm and spoke in very positive terms, wrote Lewis with characteristic understatement. Only the presence of Indian women and children and the quick-thinking statesmanship of the Brule chief Black Buffalo averted conflict. The Americans tossed the Indians some tobacco as a token tribute, and the Sioux allowed them to proceed. But it was touch and go. Lewis and Clark failed the first serious test of their Indian diplomacy. They had a lot to learn if the expedition was to navigate successfully the turbulent waters of inter- and intra-tribal politics. A winter in the Mandan villages, the first major objective in Lewis and Clark's transcontinental odyssey, provided an invaluable crash course. Surrounded by extensive fields of corn, beans, squash, and sunflowers that the women cultivated and that were the basis of their prosperity and trade, the villages of the Mandans and their Hidatsa neighbors straddled the great bend of the Missouri in present-day North Dakota. They were a great marketplace and crossroads, the hub of a huge intertribal trading network in which Plains Indians exchanged horses and the products of buffalo hunting for guns, trade goods, and agricultural produce. Indian traders from deep in the plains traveled to the upper Missouri villages, then returned home to trade the goods they had acquired to other Indian peoples. Spanish, 
British, and French Canadian traders operated in and around the Missouri villages. Unfortunately, the same location and circumstances that made the villages a gathering place of nations guaranteed that they would be transformed into death traps when epidemic diseases raced along the trade routes. The smallpox epidemic of 1779-81 to had hit the villagers hard. There were other outbreaks on the Missouri early in the 19th century, and the epidemic of 1837 virtually destroyed the Mandans. The winter spent with the Mandans was one of the high points of the expedition. In Mandan lodges, the Americans found shelter from winter on the northern plains and corn to get them through the season. From Mandan people, they learned about tribes they could expect to encounter when they resumed their journey westward in the spring. One chief drew Clark a sketch of the country as far as the Rocky Mountains. Mandans and Americans visited back and forth, joined in each other's dances, hunted buffalo together, and together pursued Sioux horse raiders. Members of the expedition slept with Mandan women, and the expedition blacksmith mended Mandan axes and hoes in exchange for corn. With no other group did Lewis and Clark's men live so closely, for so long, and on such good terms. They enjoyed good relations with other Indian peoples, the Shoshones and Nez Perces in particular, but their months with the Mandans demonstrated the capacity of one group of humans to coexist harmoniously with another, at least for a time. It was not an experience repeated often in subsequent relations between the United States and the Indian peoples of the West. Despite the warmth of Mandan hospitality, Lewis and Clark were eager to be on their way. They left the Mandan villages in April as soon as the ice broke on the Missouri. They hoped to locate a northwest passage that would provide a water route across the continent to the Pacific. The maps available at the time showed the Rockies to be a thin line of mountains not far from the Pacific. Once they reached the headwaters of the Missouri, a short portage over the crest of the mountains would bring them to another river that would carry them down to the ocean. But when Lewis and his companions reached that crest, all they saw was range after range after range of mountains. The maps were wrong, there was no Northwest Passage, and the very survival of the expedition was in jeopardy if they did not make it over those mountain barriers before winter. While the expedition was at the Mandan villages, they had been joined by a Shoshone woman, actually a teenager, whom the neighboring Hadatsas had captured in a raid as a child. Sakagawea was married to Toussaint Charbonneau, a French-Canadian trader who became one of the expedition's interpreters. She proved invaluable when the Americans made contact with the Shoshones in the Rocky Mountains. The Shoshones provided them with horses and guides to get them over the mountains. The Nez Perces took them in and fed them when they came staggering down the Lolo Trail, starved and half-frozen. Rejuvenated, the expedition put canoes into the mighty Columbia River and, speeding past the massive rapids and salmon fishing grounds at the Dallas, paddled hard for the Pacific. Far from home, wet and dispirited, they did not like the Chinooks and Clatsops who lived near the mouth of the Columbia, nor did they find the women attractive. The tribes practiced ornamental head flattening, they were rife with venereal disease, and marks of smallpox were common. They also drove hard bargains, and some swore like sailors. The Indians, in turn, had little time for the expedition. They were used to dealing with merchants who arrived from the ocean in ships laden with cargo, and they paid scant regard to a bunch of disheveled Americans who arrived from the mountains with little but the buttons on their coats to trade. When spring came, Lewis and Clark were anxious to depart for home. Trudging back across the mountains, they made their way through countless Indian groups. Although relations were not always harmonious, their tempers flared often, and they were now more interested in putting Indians behind them than in conducting diplomacy with them, they avoided conflict with the Indian peoples they encountered, except for one occasion, when Lewis separated from Clark and ran into a party of Blackfeet. By April 1806, they were back in St. Louis. The Lewis and Clark expedition was not a total success. It failed to find a water route to the Pacific, the fabled Northwest Passage giving access to the markets of the Far East that had been a dream of empire builders for generations, because none existed. It failed to establish intertribal peace on the Missouri River and instead cemented Sioux and Blackfeet hostility toward the United States. But it did put the West on the American map. As the Corps of Discovery made its way through Indian country, 
Lewis and Clark presented tribal leaders with so-called peace medals struck by the U.S. Mint, featuring a profile of President Jefferson on one side and on the other side, a pair of clasped hands indicating a pledge of friendship with the United States. It was a hopeful gesture in some ways, but it concealed cynical and acquisitive motives. Three additional expeditions set forth between 1804 and 1806 to explore the contested southwestern border of the Louisiana Purchase. The first left from Natchez, Mississippi, and ascended the Red River to the Washita River, ending in present-day Arkansas. Two years later, the second group followed the Red River west into eastern Texas. The third embarked from St. Louis and traveled west, deep into the Rockies. This last group, led by Zebulon Pike, had gone too far in the view of the Spaniards. Pike and his men were arrested, taken to northern Mexico, and released. Of the scores of Indian peoples in this lower Great Plains region, two in particular dominated their territories. The Osage ruled the land between the Mississippi and the lower Arkansas rivers, while the Comanche controlled the territory from the upper Arkansas River to the Rockies and south into Texas. Both were formidable powers that had proved equal to the Spaniards. The Osage asserted themselves through careful diplomacy and periodic shows of strength, the Comanche by expert horsemanship, a brisk trade in guns and captives, and a readiness to employ deadly force. In 1804, Jefferson invited Osage leaders to the capital, where he greeted them with ceremonies and gifts. He positioned the Osage as equals of the Americans. Jefferson wanted to introduce new agricultural tools to the Osage, hoes and plows for the men, spinning wheels and looms for the women. They implied a departure from the native gender system in which women tended crops while men hunted game. If the Osage became an agricultural people, Jefferson believed, Men would give up the hunt and therefore need less land. Commerce is the great engine by which we are to coerce them, Jefferson wrote, not war. In exchange, the Osage asked for protection against Indian refugees dispossessed by American settlers and pushed into their lands. Jefferson's Osage alliance proved to be expensive, driven up by the costs of providing defense, brokering treaties, and giving gifts. This was part of a larger scheme Jefferson hatched to use trade to force Indians to give up their claims to territory, surrender their sovereignty to the United States, and to assimilate to the white dominant culture. In a letter to William Henry Harrison, governor of the Indiana Territory, Jefferson wrote that Indian exposure to the superiority of Euro-American civilization will lead them to perceive how useless to them are their extensive forests and then they will be willing to pair them off from time to time in exchange for necessaries for their farms and families. To promote this process, we shall push our trading houses and be glad to see the good and influential individuals run into debt because we observe that when these debts get beyond what the individuals can pay, they become willing to lop them off by a session of lands. In this way, American settlements would gradually surround the Indians, and they will in time either incorporate with us as citizens of the United States or remove beyond the Mississippi. Aside from Jefferson's hopes for Indian assimilation, the acquisition of so vast a territory to the West accorded with the Democratic-Republican notion of the nation's growth over space rather than over time as the Federalists treasured. Jefferson imagined that the American population would even out between East and West halting the growth of the coastal cities and, he hoped, diffusing the number of slaves to such an extent that slavery would cease to be profitable. The nation's agriculture would be entirely dominated by yeoman farmers and small commercial farmers, the latter of whom Jefferson imagined would prefer to hire wage laborers than take on the expense of purchasing and maintaining slaves. Coupled with his signing a total ban on slave importations in 1808, he thought that slavery would then die the way an arm or leg might wither away following the application of a tourniquet. He was quite wrong in nearly every respect of his hopes and predictions, and he lived to realize it. These peace initiatives were short-lived. By 1808, warfare was on the rise, and the governor of the Louisiana Territory declared that the U.S. government no longer had an obligation to protect the Osage from Native American refugees displaced by American expansion. 
Jefferson's presidency was near its end, and soon the United States returned to its practice of whittling away Indian lands through coercive treaties so familiar to men like Tecumseh. Four treaties between 1808 and 1839 dramatically shrank the Osage lands. By the 1860s, the Osage were relocated to present-day Oklahoma. The Comanche, by contrast, forcefully resisted U.S. expansion. Over the previous decades, they had established their dominance of a vast region known as Comancheria, which stretched across much of New Spain and now straddled the border with the Louisiana Territory. Trade relations flourished, with American traders allowed to enter Comancheria to attend local market fairs, selling weapons, cloth, and household metal goods in exchange for horses, bison, and furs. No matter what the map of the United States might look like, on the ground, Comancheria remained under the control of the Comanche and off-limits to American settlement, a dynamic that would not change until much later in the 19th century. On the political front, there were signs of division among the Democratic Republicans. Jefferson shared Hamilton's distrust of Aaron Burr, whose political style was surprisingly modern and rejected the pretense of selfless disinterestedness valued in the previous century. Burr, frustrated by Jefferson's determination to keep him as out of the loop on executive decision-making as his predecessor John Adams had done, essentially abandoned his role as vice president. He ran for governor of New York in 1804, and in April of that year, an Albany newspaper printed a letter written by a friend of Alexander Hamilton's that quoted the former Treasury Secretary as saying that Burr was a dangerous man and one who ought not be trusted with the reins of government. This led to a barrage of insults between them in the partisan newspapers that ended with Burr's challenging Hamilton to a duel. Now, this was not unusual for the time, when it was considered important for public men to uphold their reputations as honorable and virtuous men. Any man who cast aspersions upon another man's character and reputation in public could expect a response in the form of a demand for retraction delivered by the injured party's friends to the antagonist's friends. If this was refused, then a challenge may follow. To refrain from doing so would, in the public eye, suggest that the accusations were true, and in most cases, when so challenged, the antagonist may issue some sort of acceptable retraction or apology. However, if some kind of settlement could not be reached, then the two men's representatives would arrange to hold the quote-unquote affair of honor in some out-of-the-way place. Hamilton refused to take back his statements against Burr's character, and so in July 1804 they met in a field near Weehawken, New Jersey. Most movies depicting duels tend to get it wrong, showing the two pacing away from each other and firing at each other simultaneously. In fact, according to the usual rules, the insulted party got the first shot. Bear in mind, they were shooting with smoothbore pistols. These are the ones actually used in the Burr-Hamilton duel. And the accuracy of these was really low, especially once you got 20 paces away from your target. If you are the one being shot at, you would turn 90 degrees to one side or the other to give your opponent as narrow a target as possible and hope that he misses. If the first shot misses or does not drop the antagonist, then it's his turn to fire, and so it goes until either somebody backs down or gets shot and cannot continue. Most duels never came off because once on the field, somebody often backed down and agreed to drop the matter or render an apology. That did not happen in the case of Burr and Hamilton. This was a very personal matter for both men, Burr knowing that Hamilton had consistently frustrated his political ambitions and Hamilton being certain that Burr was reckless and lacking in the kind of disinterestedness that had made Washington a great leader. Hamilton had previously lost his eldest son in a duel, and he poured out his anguish in a letter to his wife the night before his fatal meeting with Burr, but he refused to back down. In a break from tradition, Burr and Hamilton agreed to draw lots to see who got to take the first shot, which Hamilton won. Burr correctly guessed that Hamilton would intentionally miss, which he did, while Hamilton may have been similarly gambling that Burr would then intentionally miss his shot. 
At this point, they could settle their affair with no chance of bloodshed, honor being technically satisfied. However, Burr took aim and fired directly at Hamilton, the ball hitting the former Treasury Secretary and architect of the Federalist Party in the abdomen just below the ribcage. Hamilton dropped on the spot and was rushed to a nearby friend's house while Burr was hustled away. Hamilton died the next day, and Burr ended up having to leave the state for a time, but eventually he returned and was never charged for murder. He finished out his term as vice president, but refused to run again for president against Jefferson, who was expected to win re-election handily. Burr went on to become involved in a bizarre conspiracy to effect a secession of the Trans-Appalachian states and territories from the Union to form a new republic with himself as its president. He was exposed by Brigadier General James Wilkinson, who was either a co-conspirator who got cold feet or who had been stringing Burr along in order to gain favor with President Jefferson. Burr was arrested and charged with treason in the Supreme Court, but acquitted due to a lack of evidence, and also because Chief Justice John Marshall believed that treason must involve more than mere plotting. Burr retreated to England for a decade, then returned to New York and was eventually able to begin practicing law again, which he did for the rest of his life, though he constantly suffered from financial setbacks and heavy debt. Funnily enough, in old age, Burr married a wealthy widow, who then, four months later, sued for divorce when her money started to get used to cover his losses in various land speculation schemes. Her attorney, Alexander Hamilton, Jr., when Jefferson was re-elected in 1804, the threat of war loomed. Hoping to avoid a costly and dangerous confrontation, Jefferson tried a novel tactic, an embargo. His successor, James Madison, continued the policy, but domestic dissent grew. In 1812, the United States declared war on Britain and on Tecumseh's Indian Confederacy. The two-year war cost the young nation its White House and its capital, but ended in a triumphant, if symbolic, victory. After a brief truce, warfare between France and Britain resumed in 1803. Maintaining the policy George Washington had first established with his Neutrality Proclamation of 1793, Jefferson continued to insist on a U.S. right to trade with all nations. That objective became increasingly unattainable. As war engulfed Europe, both Britain and France expanded their campaigns to the commercial realm. Napoleon, in control of most of continental Europe, imposed a blockade on trade with Britain, including trade with neutral powers. British authorities responded with their own order forbidding trade with France. The United States was stuck in the middle. Both Britain and France stopped U.S. ships and seized their cargoes, but Britain took the policy a step further, seizing suspected deserters from the British Navy. Many of those seized were not British deserters, but Americans. In an age before passports with photographs or standardized citizenship laws, asserting U.S. citizenship was much harder. Ultimately, the British forced 2,500 American citizens to man their ships at war with France. In retaliation for the impressment of American sailors, Congress passed a non-importation law banning particular British-made goods. One event particularly provoked U.S. popular opinion. In June 1807, a British frigate policing Chesapeake Bay in U.S. territory stopped the American ship Chesapeake, ordering the Americans to turn over British deserters on board. When the Chesapeake refused, the British opened fire, killing three Americans. In response, Congress passed the Embargo Act of 1807, prohibiting U.S. ships from sailing to any foreign port or place. Using economic pressure to force the British into concessions, the drastic measure brought an immediate halt to all overseas trade. The Embargo Act was a disaster. From 1790 to 1807, U.S. exports had increased fivefold. The embargo brought them to a standstill. Unemployment soared in New England, the heart of the shipping industry. Grain plummeted in value, river traffic halted. Tobacco rotted in the South, and cotton went unpicked. Federal government revenues plunged as import duties collapsed. Protest petitions flooded Washington. The Federalist Party, in danger of fading away after its showing in the election of 1804, began to revive 
by ridiculing Jefferson and his foreign policy. Federalist popularity did not grow enough to win the presidency in 1808, however. Secretary of State James Madison succeeded Jefferson, maintaining the Democratic-Republican hold on the office. Support for the Federalists remained centered in New England, whose economy was most reliant on foreign shipping, while Democratic-Republicans held the balance of power nationwide. Madison inherited the international tensions stemming from the impressment and embargo controversies when he became president, but they were not the only foreign crises to fall in his lap, for nowhere was the threat of war greater than on the United States' western front. After the 1795 Treaty of Greenville, the U.S. settler population north of the Ohio River had grown dramatically, putting intense pressure on the remaining native lands in the northwest. The 1810 census counted some 230,000 Americans in Ohio, while another 40,000 inhabited the territories of Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan. The American Indian population of the same area was probably about 70,000. Since the collapse of the Northwest Confederacy in 1794, American Indians had divided over the best strategy for retaining their autonomy. On the one hand were those, like the Miami leader Little Turtle, who sought some form of accommodation with the United States to protect their people's lands. Confronting the tide of settlers and native refugees pouring into the Ohio Valley, they believed the best approach to retaining their lands was to abandon traditional hunting practices and adopt Euro-American methods of agriculture. Often privileging their tribal loyalties over the interests of Native Americans as a whole, they negotiated the best deals they could and redistributed the revenues to their people. On the other hand were those who, drawing on decades of resistance to European and American encroachment, believed that Indian lands belonged to Native peoples in common and could not be sold. These militants rejected the accommodationist tactics of their opponents. No tribe has the right to sell these lands, even to each other, much less to strangers, proclaimed Tecumseh, who emerged as the leader of the militant faction. Sell a country? Why not sell the air, the great sea, as well as the earth? Didn't the great spirit make them all for the use of his children? Like the Iroquois, the Shawnee nation had lost land, suffered defeat in battle, and seen its culture assaulted. In the first decade of the 19th century, however, two Shawnees emerged as leaders in a pan-Indian religious and political movement. Tecumseh's brother, Lala Wethika, lived an early life of drunkenness and debauchery. In 1805, he fell into a trance and experienced a vision which caused him to transform his life and change his name to Tenskwataway, which translates as the open door, and bring a message of hope to his people. Tenskwataway preached that the master of life had selected him to spread the new religion among the Indians. Indian people were warned to avoid contact with the Americans, who were children of the evil spirit. They were urged to give up alcohol, as he did, refuse intermarriage, reject Christianity, lay down manufactured tools, and throw off white man's clothing. Instead of eating the meat of domesticated animals, they should return to a diet of corn, beans, maple sugar, and other traditional foods. They should avoid intertribal conflict and practice communal ownership of property. Tenskwataway's teachings promised a revitalization of Shawnee culture, but his message also drew adherents from the Delawares, Kickapoos, Ottawas, Potawatomis, Anishinaabeg, and other tribes, especially after he accurately predicted a total eclipse of the sun on June 16, 1806, Many Indians rejected his message, however, but hundreds of others flocked to the village he established at Prophetstown on the Tippecanoe River in Indiana. However, it was the Shawnee prophet's brother Tecumseh who gave strongest direction to the developing movement of Indian unity. Tecumseh had fought at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794, but he refused to sign the Treaty of Greenville. Identifying American expansion and piecemeal sessions of land as the major threat to Indian survival, Tecumseh argued that no tribe had the right to sell their lands because the lands belonged to all Indian people. He denounced older chiefs who signed away tribal territory 
and his influence soared after pro-American chiefs ceded more than three million acres to the United States at a so-called Whiskey Treaty at Fort Wayne in 1809. Tecumseh traveled from the Great Lakes to Florida, carrying his message of pan-Indian land tenure and preaching a vision of an independent, amalgamated Indian nation stretching from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico. Tenskwatoway's teachings and Tecumseh's vision alarmed the U.S. government, especially the governor of Indiana Territory, General William Henry Harrison, who had built his career advancing Jefferson's policies of national expansion and Indian dispossession. In 1811, Harrison led an army in a preemptive strike against the Prophet's village at Tippecanoe while Tecumseh was away in the south. The battle was a relatively minor affair. Tecumseh dismissed it as a scuffle between children, but the Americans claimed a major victory, the Prophet lost prestige, and Tecumseh's Confederacy suffered a setback and loss of momentum. When the War of 1812 broke out between Britain and the United States, Tecumseh sided with the British in a last attempt to stem the tide of American expansion. The British-American alliance scored some early victories, but Britain was distracted by its involvement in European resistance to Napoleon. When Tecumseh was killed fighting Harrison's army at the Battle of the Thames in Ontario in 1813, the last hope of united Indian resistance east of the Mississippi also died. In the South, Alexander McGillivray of the Creeks had led his confederacy of tribes in dealing with Spain, the United States, and Georgia in the decade after the Revolution, but his death in 1793 created room for division within the confederacy. Tensions escalated after Tecumseh traveled the southeast with his message of united Indian resistance in 1811. Upper Creek towns tended to favor adopting a militant stance in dealing with the United States, Lower Creek towns tended to advocate peace and accommodation. Conflicts within the Creek Confederacy spilled over into attacks on American settlers, and the United States responded with swift military action against the militant Creeks, or Red Sticks. In the Creek War of 1813-1814, General Andrew Jackson directed a series of devastating campaigns that culminated in the slaughter of some 800 Creek warriors at the Battle of Tohopeka, or Horseshoe Bend, on the Tallapoosa River in present-day Alabama in March 1814. About 500 Cherokees and 100 Lower Creeks helped Jackson win his victory. But at the Treaty of Fort Jackson, the general dictated punitive terms that divested the Creek Nation of 23 million acres, or two-thirds of their tribal domain, much of it taken from Jackson's Lower Creek allies. It was the single largest cession of territory ever made in the Southeast and initiated a boom in land sales and cotton production in the Deep South. The Indian conflicts were conflated with the wider conflict with Britain, now known as the War of 1812. In 1809, Congress had replaced Jefferson's embargo with the Non-Intercourse Act. It limited trade prohibitions to Britain and France and their colonies, opening up other trade routes and alleviating the distress of American shippers, farmers, and planters. Nonetheless, Britain and France continued to attack U.S. ships. By 1811, the country was seriously divided and on the verge of war. In March 1811, several dozen young Republicans from the West and South ascended to Congress. They would be known as the War Hawks. Led by 34-year-old Henry Clay from Kentucky and 29-year-old John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, they believed a war with Britain would consolidate the U.S. hold on the Northwest and finally end the impressment of Americans on the high seas. Many were expansionists looking to invade Spanish Florida and Canada. Clay was elected Speaker of the House, an extraordinary honor for a newcomer, and Calhoun won a seat on the Foreign Relations Committee. The War Hawks approved major military expenditures and the Army soon quadrupled in size. In June 1812, Congress declared war on Great Britain. The vote divided along sectional lines. New England and some Middle Atlantic states opposed the war, fearing its effects on commerce, while the South and West strongly favored it. Ironically, Britain had just announced that it would stop the search and seizure of American ships. The war momentum would not be slowed, however. 
the Foreign Relations Committee issued an elaborate justification titled Report on the Causes and Reasons for War, written mainly by Calhoun and containing extravagant language about Britain's lust for power, unbounded tyranny, and mad ambition. The Warhawks proposed an invasion of Canada, confidently predicting victory in four weeks. Even Thomas Jefferson believed that it was, according to him, a mere matter of marching. Instead, the war lasted two and a half years, and Canada never fell. The invasion turned into a series of blunders that revealed the country's weakness against the powerful British and Indian forces. By the fall of 1812, the outlook was grim. Worse, a powerful current of dissent to the war emerged in New England. States delayed raising troops, while many New England merchants traded illegally with Britain. In the election of 1812, not a single New England state voted for Madison except Vermont. In late 1812 and early 1813, the tide began to turn. The United States won several naval victories. In April 1813, the Americans attacked York, now Toronto, and burned it. A few months later, Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry defeated the British fleet at the western end of Lake Erie. Emboldened, General Harrison drove an army into Canada from Detroit and defeated the British and Indians at the Battle of the Thames in October 1813, where Tecumseh was killed. In August 1814, British ships sailed into Chesapeake Bay, landing 5,000 troops and throwing the capital into a panic. Families evacuated, banks hid their money, and government clerks carted away boxes of important papers. James Madison's wife, Dolly, fled with her husband's papers while servants rescued a portrait of George Washington. The British torched the White House, the Capitol, a newspaper office, and a well-stocked arsenal. Instead of holding the city, though, the British headed north and attacked Baltimore, where the Maryland militia successfully defended the city. In another offensive that month, British troops marched from Canada into New York State. After losing a naval skirmish at Plattsburgh on Lake Champlain, they retreated. Five months later, a large British army landed in Lower Louisiana. In early January 1815, it encountered General Andrew Jackson and his militia just outside New Orleans in the war's final battle. Jackson's forces won a tremendous victory in the Battle of New Orleans. The British suffered between 2,000 and 3,000 casualties, the Americans fewer than 80. Jackson instantly became a national hero. No one in the United States knew that negotiators in Europe had signed a peace agreement two weeks earlier. The news had not yet crossed the Atlantic. The Treaty of Ghent, signed in December 1814, settled few of the issues that had led to war between Britain and the United States in the first place. Neither country emerged victorious and no land changed hands. The Americans dropped their demand for an end to impressment, which subsided when war between Britain and France finally ended in 1815. They also gave up any claims to Canada. The British agreed to stop all aid to Indians in the Northwest. Nothing was said about shipping rights, the ostensible cause of the war. The most concrete result was a plan for a future commission to determine the boundary between the United States and Canada west of the Great Lakes. Anti-war Federalists in New England could not gloat over the war's ambiguous conclusion, however. In an ill-timed move, the region's leaders had convened a secret meeting in Hartford, Connecticut. They discussed a series of proposals to reduce the South's power and break Virginia's hold on the presidency. Delegates to the Hartford Convention accused President Madison of waging the war against Britain to harm the northern states for the benefit of the southern states, and thus engaging in a partisan war rather than a true war for national honor. They proposed a constitutional amendment to abolish the three-fifths clause and thus shift the demographic weight in Congress to favor the northern states. They wanted to require a two-thirds vote instead of a simple majority for imposing embargoes, admitting new states, or declaring war. They wanted to limit the president to one term and prohibit the election of successive presidents from the same state. They even discussed secession from the Union if their demands were not immediately met. 
Although the proposals were reasonable, or at least most of them, the timing could not have been worse. December 1814, the very month U.S. diplomats signed the Treaty of Ghent, by its meeting, the Federalist Party looked unpatriotic, even treasonous. It never recovered. Within a few years, the party disappeared entirely. Although the United States did not exactly win the War of 1812, Americans celebrated as though they had. Only 30 years from its independence, the United States had fought its former colonial master, Europe's greatest power, to a draw. Admittedly, British forces were tied down in Europe in the incomparably bigger and more significant Napoleonic Wars against France. The war, which many saw as a second American Revolution, gave rise to a new spirit of American nationalism. Lingering fears about the nation's fragility began to wane. If the United States did not exactly win the War of 1812, there could be little doubt that American Indians in the West lost it. Tecumseh was dead, his brother, the prophet, discredited. Once again, British negotiators abandoned their Native American allies in European peace negotiations. The prospects for an Indian Confederacy were dashed, and with them any last hope of an internationally recognized American Indian homeland with borders protected from U.S. settlement. Further south, the Creeks lost millions of acres of land in vast areas of the Southwest, the future Cotton Belt, now open to a frenzied U.S. expansion. The consequences would prove devastating for Native Americans, for slaves, and eventually for the nation's very integrity. Back in Washington, Dolly Madison was busy reinventing the role of the president's wife. She pioneered the role of First Lady as we know it by hosting social events at the White House and creating an active role for elite women in political affairs. But as with the 1790s ideal of Republican motherhood, Mrs. Madison and her female circle engaged in politics to further men's careers. There was little talk of the rights of woman. Indeed, from 1800 to 1825, key institutions shaping women's lives, the legal system, marriage, and religion, proved stubbornly resistant to change. Nonetheless, the increased commitment to female education that began in the 1780s continued into the 19th century. Although women could not vote or hold office, the female relatives of Washington politicians played an important role in the nation's political life. They networked through dinners, balls, receptions, and the intricate custom of calling in which men and women paid brief visits at each other's homes. Webs of friendship and influence in turn facilitated female political lobbying. Dolly Madison built elaborate social networks during Jefferson's presidency that flourished during her husband's administration. Called by some the Presidentress, Mrs. Madison struck a balance between queenliness and Republican openness. She dressed in resplendent clothes and opened three elegant rooms in the executive mansion for a weekly open house party called Mrs. Madison's Crush or squeeze. In contrast to George and Martha Washington's stiff, brief receptions, the Madison's parties went on for hours. They became indispensable events for the scores or even hundreds of guests who milled about, trading information and establishing relationships over food and drink. Members of Congress, cabinet officers, distinguished guests, envoys from foreign countries, and their wives all orbited around Mrs. Madison's salons. President Madison, by contrast, was deeply shy and could often be found at these occasions in a distant corner of the room, nursing a glass of wine and counting the minutes until he could respectably leave. In 1810 to 1811, the executive mansion acquired its present name, the White House. Dolly Madison, a major asset to her shy husband, understood how the White House could enhance the power and legitimacy of the presidency and how her social events could advance his political agenda. Whatever part elite women like Mrs. Madison played in the political life of the young republic, the broader legal context sharply limited most women's public roles. In English common law, the legal doctrine of femme couvert, or covered woman, otherwise known as laws of coverture, held that a wife had no legal or political personhood independent of her husband. A wife was obligated to obey her husband. 
Her property belonged to him, as did her domestic and sexual services, and even their children. Wives had no right to make contracts, keep their wages, or sue or be sued. Even as they redrafted other British laws to make them more Republican, American state legislatures largely left the laws of domestic relations untouched. The unequal power relations at the heart of marriage seemed natural to most Americans. The one aspect of family law that changed in the early republic was divorce. Before the revolution, only New England jurisdictions recognized a limited right to divorce. By 1820, every state except South Carolina did. A mutual wish to terminate a marriage was never sufficient grounds for a legal divorce, however. Many states required a petition to the legislature for a divorce, a daunting obstacle for most people. Marriage, according to the law, protected people deemed naturally dependent, that is, women and children, and regulated the use and inheritance of property. Only certain reasons could justify its dissolution. Legal enforcement of marriage and femme couvert helped maintain gender inequality in the 19th century. Single adult women had more legal rights. They could own and convey property, make contracts, initiate lawsuits, and pay taxes, but their civil status remained limited, too. They could not vote, except in New Jersey before 1807, serve on juries, or practice law. Social customs further restricted single women's economic status. Job prospects were few and low-paying. Unless they inherited property or lived with married siblings, single adult women in the early republic were usually poor. None of the laws that structured white gender relations applied to slaves. As property, enslaved people had no legal ability to consent to contractual obligations, including marriage. Enslaved men and women thus lacked the protections of state-sponsored unions. Because they were not recognized by law, and could be torn apart at any moment by sale or the whim of a slave owner, slave marriages and family relations developed different customs, dynamics, and meanings than did those among whites. Extended networks of kinship powerfully shaped slaves' worlds, providing emotional sustenance and even structuring forms of property ownership on plantations in ways that lay completely outside the formal legal system. In most Protestant denominations around 1800, white women made up the majority of congregants. Although leadership generally rested in men's hands, some exceptions existed. In Baptist congregations in New England, women served on church governance committees, deciding on the admission of new members, voting on hiring ministers, and even debating doctrinal points. Quakers, too, had a history of giving power to women. Some achieved the status of minister, capable of leading and speaking in Quaker meetings. Between 1790 and 1820, a small number of women ascended to positions of open spiritual leadership. Most came from Free Will Baptist groups in New England and upstate New York, others from small Methodist sects, while some lacked any formal religious affiliation at all. Probably fewer than a hundred such women existed, but several dozen traveled beyond their communities, creating converts and controversy. They spoke without prepared speeches, often exhibiting trances and claiming to exhort rather than to preach. The best-known exhorting woman was Jemima Wilkinson, who called herself the public universal friend. After a near-death experience from high fever, Wilkinson proclaimed her body no longer female or male, but the incarnation of the spirit of light. She dressed in men's clothes, wore her hair in a masculine style, shunned gender-specific pronouns, and preached openly in Rhode Island and Philadelphia. In the early 19th century, Wilkinson established a town called New Jerusalem in western New York with some 250 followers. Periodic newspaper articles kept her in the public eye, feeding curiosity about her cross-dressing and her unfeminine forcefulness. The decades from 1790 to the 1820s were a period of remarkable confusion, ferment, and creativity in American religion. New denominations blossomed. Fervent religious passion gripped adherents, while a burgeoning religious press popularized extraordinary theological and institutional innovations. In this climate, the most radically democratic churches contested entrenched traditions of gender subordination, but male religious authority withstood the challenge. 
Denominations that accepted women's participation in church governance eventually began to pull back, reinstating patterns of hierarchy along gender lines. I'll have more to say about this in a future lecture. Because an educated citizenry was deemed essential to a republic, states and localities began investing in public schools. Young girls attended district schools along with boys. By 1830, they had made rapid gains. In many places, female literacy rates approached those of males. If educational opportunities broadened dramatically in this period, however, they were not universal. Most schools were located in northern states, and few addressed the needs of free black children, whether male or female. More advanced female education came from a growing number of private academies. In 1800, Judith Sargent Murray, the Massachusetts author who had called for equality of the sexes a decade earlier, predicted a new era in female history from the female academies that are everywhere establishing. Some dozen were founded in the 1790s. By 1830, the number had grown to nearly 200. Students between 12 and 16 years old came from elite families as well as middling families with intellectual aspirations. They studied ornamental arts like drawing, needlework, or French conversation, as well as more academic subjects such as English grammar, literature, history, the natural sciences, geography, and elocution, the art of effective public speaking. Unlike theological seminaries that trained men for the clergy, many female academies prepared their students to teach. The most immediate value of female academies came from the self-cultivation and confidence they fostered. Following the model of male colleges, female graduation exercises featured speeches performed in front of family, friends, and local notables. Elocution, a common subject in the academies, taught the young women the art of persuasion along with correct pronunciation and the skill of public speaking. Bowing to the widespread hostility toward learned women, however, academies took care to promote female modesty. Advanced education was limited to a tiny subset of the population, fewer than 1% of their age group. Nonetheless, by the mid-1820s, the total annual enrollment at female academies equaled the enrollment at the nearly six dozen male colleges in the United States. Male students generally became ministers, lawyers, judges, and political leaders, while most female graduates in time married and raised families. Before getting married, however, many women taught at academies and district schools. A large number also became authors, contributing essays and poetry to newspapers, editing periodicals, and publishing novels. If it was not exactly revolutionary, this attention to training female minds laid the foundation for major transformations in the gender system as girls of the 1810s matured into adult women of the 1830s. After the War of 1812, the men called War Hawks took up the banner of the Democratic Republican Party and carried it in new directions. These young politicians favored trade, Western expansion, internal improvements, and the development of new markets. Virginians continued their hold on the presidency with the election of James Monroe in 1816. The collapse of the Federalist Party ushered in an apparent period of one-party rule. In 1820, Monroe won re-election with all but one electoral vote. At the state level, increasing political engagement sparked a drive for universal white male suffrage. At the national level, bitter feelings emerged in response to a sectional crisis over the admission of Missouri to the Union. Controversies over Latin American independence and European involvement in the region animated sharp disagreements as well. Four candidates vied for the presidency in 1824 in an election decided by the House of Representatives. One-party rule was far from harmonious. In the 1780s, 12 of the original 13 states enacted property qualifications based on the ancient theory that only male freeholders, landowners as distinct from tenants or servants, had sufficient economic independence to be entrusted with the vote. Over the course of the next generation, this idea of suffrage collapsed as American political life was radically democratized. In the 1790s, Vermont became the first state to enfranchise all adult males. Meanwhile, four other states broadened suffrage by allowing all male taxpayers to vote. As new states in the West joined the Union, most extended voting rights to all free white men. Pressure grew for eastern states to broaden their suffrage laws. Not everyone favored expanded suffrage. 
propertied elites tended to support the status quo, but they found themselves on the defensive as the American Revolution's ideological assault on monarchy extended to ever more elements of the country's political life. Under pressure, state legislatures called new constitutional conventions to debate questions of suffrage, balloting procedures, apportionment, and representation. By 1820, half a dozen states had reformed their voting laws. Some enacted universal manhood suffrage, while others tied the vote to tax status or militia service. 18th century ideas of republican government gradually turned into 19th century ideas of democratic government. The disfranchised no longer accepted the idea that landowners had greater independence or superior virtue. Owning land was no more predictive of wisdom and good character than it was of a person's height or strength, said an observer. Both sides of the debate generally agreed that character mattered, as did maintaining an electorate of sufficient wisdom. The exclusion of paupers and felons convicted of infamous crimes found favor in many states. The exclusion of women provoked no discussion in constitutional conventions, so firm was the legal principle of femme couvert subjecting married women to their husbands. In one exceptional moment, at the Virginia Constitutional Convention in 1829, a delegate wondered aloud why unmarried women older than 21 could not vote. He was silenced with the argument that all women lacked the necessary free agency and intelligence. The voting rights of free black men was another story. This topic generated extensive discussion at all the conventions. Under freehold qualifications, a small number of property black men could vote. Universal or taxpayer suffrage would inevitably enfranchise many more. Many delegates at various state conventions spoke against that extension, claiming that blacks as a race lacked virtue, independence, and education. With the exception of New York, which retained the existing property qualifications for black voters as it removed it for whites, most states expanded suffrage for whites while restricting it for blacks. Monroe's first term in office saw one of the most significant political crises of the early 19th century. Since 1815, four states had joined the Union, Indiana, Mississippi, Illinois, and Alabama, bringing the total number to 22. All had followed the orderly blueprint laid out by the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. States north of the Ohio River entered the Union as free states, while those south of the river entered as slave states. Then, in February 1819, Missouri, a territory recently taken from the Osage Indians, applied for statehood. Missouri posed a problem. The Northwest Ordinance said nothing about the territory west of the Mississippi River, and geography provided no obvious solution. Positioned just to the west of the free state of Illinois, most of its territory lay north of the latitude of the Ohio River's mouth and yet Missouri's population already included 10,000 slaves brought there by southern planters. What to do? New York Congressman James Talmadge, Jr. proposed a solution, offering two amendments to the statehood bill. The first stipulated that slaves born in Missouri after statehood would be free at age 25, and the second declared that no new slaves could be imported into the state. Talmadge's proposal was not particularly radical. Based on New York's Emancipation Law of 1799, it put forward a gradual abolition scheme that would not strip slave owners of their property. Over time, however, it would make Missouri a free state. Talmadge's amendments generated a firestorm of opposition that threatened to tear the political system apart. Until that point, the number of states in which slavery was legal matched the number in which it had either been abolished or been put on the road to extinction. Indeed, since the Union began admitting new states, Congress had continuously maintained a sectional balance. By 1820, the Union comprised 22 states, half of them quote-unquote free and the other half quote-unquote slave. Although the free state population exceeded that of the slave states, Southern political power drew extra strength because of the three-fifths rule. In 1820, the South owed 17 of its seats in the House of Representatives to its slave population. The Talmadge Amendments threatened to upset that delicate balance. They passed in the House by a close and sharply sectional vote that pitted North against South. 
the ferocious debate led a Georgia representative to observe that the question had started, quote, a fire which all the waters of the ocean could not extinguish. It can be extinguished only in blood, end quote. The Senate, with an even number of slave and free states, voted down the amendments. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 broke the impasse. In a set of complex negotiations brokered by Kentucky's Henry Clay, Maine, once part of Massachusetts and ineligible for statehood, nevertheless applied for statehood as a free state, thus preserving a balance between free and slave states. So that the issue would not return with each new state admission, the Senate agreed that the southern boundary of Missouri, latitude 36 degrees 30 minutes, would become the permanent line dividing slave from free states as the country expanded west. The split over Missouri threatened to realign the country's political geography. The vote was not grounded in the familiar ideological division between Federalist and Democratic Republican parties, but by a sectional division between North and South that endangered the nation's very integrity. Faced with this specter, most of the country's political leaders retreated. They agreed that the split between free and slave states was too dangerous a fault line. When new parties developed in the 1830s, their leaders took pains to bridge geography, each party developing a presence in the North and the South. If the Missouri fight did not lead to crisis in 1820, it worried many Americans to the core. This momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror, Jefferson wrote a correspondent in 1820. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. Even as Congress struggled with the future of slavery, foreign relations generated new controversies. In 1816, U.S. troops led by General Andrew Jackson invaded Spanish Florida in search of Seminole Indians harboring escaped slaves. Jackson declared himself the commander of northern Florida and demonstrated his power in 1818 by executing two British men he accused of aiding his enemies. These were acts of extreme provocation against both Spain and Great Britain. President Monroe considered court-martialing Jackson, but decided that Jackson's popularity as the hero of the Battle of New Orleans made this course of action impossible. Instead, John Quincy Adams, the Secretary of State, negotiated the adams onish Treaty with Spain, which delivered Florida to the United States in 1819 and settled the disputed borders of the Louisiana Purchase. In exchange, the United States abandoned any claims on Texas or Cuba. Although the adams onish Treaty extended U.S. borders to the South, opening future lands for the expansion of slavery, the treaty's concession angered many Southerners. With many at the leadership of the country's foreign policy, they harbored ambitions for the nation's expansion, not just west across the continent, but also south into the Caribbean and Mexico. Spain could do little to resist U.S. aggression in Florida because its colonies in the Americas were in the midst of rebellion. In the early 1820s, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and finally Mexico declared themselves independent. American popular opinion exulted at the emergence of these new sister republics in the Americas. In support, Monroe formulated a Declaration of Principles on the Americas, known in later years as the Monroe Doctrine. In 1823, the President warned that the American continents, by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintained, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European power. Any European attempt to interfere in the Western Hemisphere would be considered as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition towards the United States, and it also was a hint that any such action would be considered by the United States a declaration of war. In exchange for non-interference by Europeans, Monroe pledged that the United States would stay out of European struggles. Although couched in diplomatic language, the Monroe Doctrine was a clear assertion of American sovereignty not just in North America, but across the entire Western Hemisphere. Monroe's nonpartisan administration was the last of its kind, a throwback to 18th century ideals, as was Monroe himself, the last president to wear a powdered wig and knee breeches. 
Monroe's cabinet contained men of sharply different political views who all called themselves Democratic Republicans, or simply Republicans. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams represented the urban Northeast and believed in social reform and a robust federal government. South Carolinian John C. Calhoun spoke for the planter aristocracy as Secretary of War, promoting internal improvements, tariffs, and an aggressive foreign policy. William H. Crawford of Georgia, Secretary of the Treasury, was a proponent of Jeffersonian states' rights and limited federal power. Even before the end of Monroe's first term, these men and many others began looking ahead to the election of 1824. Political wives played key roles in their husbands' ambitions, accomplishing some of the work of modern campaign managers by courting men and women of influence. Louisa Catherine Adams threw a weekly Washington party for guests that regularly numbered in the hundreds. She made frequent social calls, sometimes as many as two dozen in a morning, and counted 68 members of Congress as her regular guests. John Quincy and Louisa Catherine Adams were not the only ones with ambitions on the presidency. Others included Henry Clay, Speaker of the House of Representatives, who promoted a package of protective tariffs to encourage manufacturing and federal expenditures for internal improvements, such as roads and canals that he dubbed the American system. Treasurer William Crawford was a favorite of Republicans from Virginia and New York. Calhoun was another serious contender, with experience in Congress and several cabinets. The final candidate was an outsider and a latecomer, General Andrew Jackson of Tennessee. Jackson had far less political experience than the others, but he enjoyed great celebrity from his military career. In 1824, on the anniversary of the Battle of New Orleans, the Adamses threw a spectacular ball in his honor, hoping to claim some of Jackson's star power. Neither yet thought of Jackson as a rival. Not long after, however, Jackson's supporters put his name forward for the presidency. Voters in the West and South reacted with enthusiasm. Adams was dismayed. Calhoun dropped out of the race and shifted his attention to winning the vice presidency. As candidates emerged, those who had once affiliated with the Federalist Party could no longer do so and expect to win any support so synonymous with treason and faithlessness had they become since the War of 1812. Those of a Hamiltonian persuasion could not think up a new label for themselves. The Democratic Republicans, for their part, had begun to discard the Republican half of their name, and by 1828 would be known simply as the Democratic Party. But each of the candidates for president in 1824 refused to be associated with either party as what historians call the first party system began to break down and be reconstituted. Although Jackson's policies aligned with the Democratic-Republicans, Thomas Jefferson saw him as an even worse political reincarnation of Aaron Burr, confiding to Daniel Webster that, I feel much alarmed at the prospect of seeing General Jackson president. He is one of the most unfit men I know of for such a place. He has had very little respect for laws and constitutions. His passions are terrible. When I was president of the Senate, he was senator and he could never speak on account of the rashness of his feelings. I have seen him attempt it repeatedly, and as often choke with rage. His passions are no doubt cooler now, but he is a dangerous man. The election of 1824 was the first to have a popular vote tally for the presidency. As they democratized the vote, 18 states out of 24 had put the power to choose members of the Electoral College directly in the hands of voters as opposed to state legislatures. Jackson dominated his rivals, winning 153,544 votes compared to Adams's 108,740. Clay won 47,136 votes and Crawford 46,618 although these are not going to matter because Crawford had suffered a debilitating stroke shortly after Election Day. Although the turnout probably amounted to just over one quarter of adult white males, the election of 1824 launched a new era in the country's political history that would be marked by intense partisanship and an energized electorate. In the Electoral College, Jackson received 99 votes, Adams 84, Crawford 41, and Clay 37. Because Jackson lacked a majority relative to the other candidates, the House of Representatives decided the election once again. 
Each congressional delegation had one vote. According to the Constitution's 12th Amendment, passed in 1804, only the top three candidates joined the runoff. Henry Clay was therefore out of the race and in a position to bestow his support on another candidate. It proved decisive. With Clay's support, Adams won by one vote in the House in February 1825. Jackson's allies called the election of 1824 the corrupt bargain. Clay's support made sense on several levels, however. Despite strong mutual dislike, he and Adams agreed on issues such as federal funding for roads and canals. Jackson's volatile temperament and unknown political views troubled Clay. What made his support look corrupt was President Adams' subsequent appointment of Clay as Secretary of State, a traditional stepping stone to the presidency. Jackson and his supporters believed the election had been stolen. The charge would motivate Jackson, who thrived on anger, while haunting Adams throughout his brief presidency. John Quincy Adams, like his father, was a one-term president. He had built his career on diplomacy, not electoral politics. His wife's rich endowments and political skills could not make up for his lack of them. Like his father before him, Adams welcomed his opposition into his cabinet. He asked Crawford to stay on in the Treasury. He retained an openly pro-Jackson postmaster general, although the position controlled thousands of patronage appointments across the nation. He even asked Jackson to become Secretary of War. Crawford and Jackson declined. Adams had lofty ambitions for his presidency. He presented a sweeping plan to Congress that called for federally funded roads, canals, and harbors. He proposed a national university in Washington and government-sponsored scientific research. He wanted to build observatories to advance astronomical knowledge and promote precision in timekeeping, and he backed a decimal-based system of weights and measures. Adams saw himself pursuing the legacy of Jefferson and Madison, using the government's powers to advance knowledge. But his opponents saw him as a latter-day Hamilton, deploying federal power illegitimately to advance commercial interests. But Adams was neither a Hamilton nor a Jefferson, and he failed to implement most of his programs. He scorned the idea of courting voters or using patronage to advance his political aims. He often used appointments to posts such as customs collectors to placate enemies rather than to reward friends. With the election of 1800, the Jeffersonian Republicans worked to undo much of what the Federalists had accomplished in the 1790s, but the promise of a simpler government gave way to the complexities of domestic and foreign politics. The Louisiana Purchase and the Barbary Wars required energetic government responses, and the threats posed by Britain on the seas finally drew the country into war once again. The War of 1812, waged against American Indian nations and the British, proved longer and more divisive than anyone imagined. The war also elevated General Andrew Jackson to national prominence. His popularity with voters in the 1824 election set the era of one-party rule of Democratic-Republicans hurtling to a close. John Quincy Adams had barely assumed office in 1825 before the election campaign of 1828 had begun. Reformed suffrage laws ensured that appeals to the mass of white male voters would become the hallmark of future elections. Many Americans, notably free black men and all women, had no place in government. Legislatures maintained women's femme couverte status, keeping wives dependent on husbands. A few women found greater personal autonomy through religion, while many others benefited from expanded female schooling in schools and academies. These substantial gains in education would blossom into a major transformation in the 1830s and 1840s. Two other developments proved momentous in later decades. In the political realm, the bitter debate over slavery that surrounded the Missouri Compromise opened divisions between northern and southern states that would expand in the decades to come. In the economic realm, Jefferson's long embargo followed by Madison's war boosted American manufacturing. When peace returned in 1815, economic development burst forth into a period of sustained growth that continued nearly unabated into the middle of the century. An interesting postscript involves the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in 1826. Most of the old revolutionaries had already passed on, but some were still around, including John Adams, who had served on the drafting committee and the Declaration's author, of course, 
Thomas Jefferson. A great commemoration was organized in Washington, D.C. for July 4th, and the two were definitely invited to be guests of honor for the event. Both declined due to ill health. Adams and Jefferson had become close friends during their time as delegates to the Second Continental Congress, but differences in political philosophy and a sharp disagreement over the French Revolution and other issues had wrinkled their relationship. Jefferson narrowly lost to Adams in the election of 1796 and bristled at being ignored for advice while vice president, and Adams proved a very sore loser when Jefferson defeated him in the election of 1800, arguably one of the nastiest political campaigns in American history, and their friendship effectively ended at that point. Jefferson, following the end of his second term of office, retired to his beloved Monticello in Virginia and only occasionally concerned himself with current events, busying himself instead with scientific endeavors and playing around with inventions. In early 1812, a letter came in the mail postmarked from Quincy, Massachusetts. It was from his former friend, John Adams, the first of what would turn out to be many. You and I have ought not to die, he wrote in one of them, before we have explained ourselves to each other. Jefferson was delighted to hear from his old friend. Dear sir, a letter from you calls up recollections very dear to my mind. It carries me back to times when, beset with difficulties and dangers, we were fellow laborers in the same cause, struggling for what is most valuable to man, his right of self-government. Over the course of the next 14 years, they exchanged 158 letters and created what many historians have come to regard as the greatest correspondence between prominent statesmen in all of American history. They agreed that the animosity that had grown between them over their political differences were the fault of Alexander Hamilton, and though they debated over current events and political philosophy, they also apologized for allowing it to become personal between them and to regret the lost years. They remembered that they were brothers in arms in carrying off what they both still believed to have been the greatest advance for humanity, and affectionately reminisced over the good old days of the Revolution. They laughingly bickered over which one was older, it was Adams, and joked darkly about their growing infirmities and the swift approach of death. By 1825, the letters between them slowed to a trickle, then ceased altogether in the spring of 1826 as their health declined and both became too feeble to write. They declined the invitation to participate in the Declaration's 50th anniversary celebrations, and as the great day drew near, both lay in what would be their deathbeds. At the beginning of July, Jefferson slipped into long periods of unconsciousness, but upon reviving would invariably ask, Is it the fourth? No, someone would say, and he would close his eyes and go back to sleep. Adams was fading quickly as well, but remained lucid until near the end. In the morning of July 4, 1826, Jefferson once again stirred awake and asked, Is it the 4th? Yes, Mr. Jefferson, it is. Upon hearing the news, he closed his eyes for the last time and died. Later that afternoon, Adams felt the end approaching, and his last words were, Jefferson still lives. Technically he was wrong, but in a way quite correct. So ended one of the most incredible eras of American history and one of the most important friendships as well.